What's up, beautiful and amazing people? How's everyone doing? How you doing, Robbie? Absolutely amazing. I'm just so thrilled to be here. Uh, I hope everyone is just enjoying themselves wherever they are in the world. We have such an exciting show ahead. I am just so excited, man, that you put this together. Um, Rocco Gardner is the co-host. He uh, he's uh, started he started Escape Studios out in uh, Pioneer Town, which is near Joshua Tree, California. I mean, your place out there has got 140 acres. I know I caught the uh, Rufus the Soul video during the pandemic, and that really <laughs> yeah. was something I was so excited about. That that background and the environment you got going on there. You got a cool little community going, huh? Yeah, so I've, I've been in the desert for about 12 years now, um, hosting all these interesting people. You mentioned Rufus the Soul, who, who made their record out there, actually, during the pandemic. Um, but our conversations never really got much beyond the ranch. Um, so we figured that we could talk more broadly and invite some interesting people that we know to have conversations in a, in a public forum. Um, so we've been doing a little bit of that on YouTube for a few months now, which is also at Escape. Um, and now we're on X as a space for creators. It's crazy, man. I mean, you must have put this together. When did you actually come up with this idea? I mean, this is, this is I'm just, it's crazy. I'm so excited right now. We actually kind of thought about it on Sunday. Um, and, and the craziest thing is that everyone that I asked to join, I said yes. Um, so now we're all here. And what made you, what, so what, what, was, what was the reason you, crypto was all involved? When, what, why, why crypto? Yeah, so this is an industry that I've been watching for some time now. And it occurred to me that a lot of it is just about speculating on cryptocurrencies, um, which kind of got me to wondering if there's more to the blockchain. Um, so I thought it'd be cool to get some people in, in that biz, um, bring them up and, and have a chat with some creatives as, as well about how they're using the blockchain. That's awesome, man. I mean, like, why, why do you think it matters to talk publicly about this stuff? I mean... I can imagine, you know, you're chilling out there, you're looking at the stars, you're meditating, doing yoga, having your organic food. I mean, you don't really need to bother with the rest of the Matrix, man. What, 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 yeah, what, what, tell me about that. Yeah, so, um, yeah, the, the way I see it is that we live in a world that, frankly, has a lot of bad news every day. Um, and I think it's important that creatives are able to express themselves, um, shine, you know, shine a light on all the bullshit. Um, and connect with other people as well, which is a you know a sign of solidarity. Um, so from what I'm gathering, um, and hopefully some of my esteemed friends will be able to fill me in on this, um, the blockchain might help with that. Um, you know, we live in a, in a world where money dictates so much of the news that we receive. Um, and if this is a way towards independence or a break from that, then, um, you know, that sounds good to me. Yeah, man, I mean, you really put together a fairly impressive panel man I'm, i mean i'm just i mean this is this is an action-packed lineup man i think i think all everyone out there is just really looking forward to this yeah well i mean you, you mentioned sitting around under the stars as well and, and sorry to answer that question we obviously do a lot of that um but you know what what we're here for or escape at least is is trying to find more of a kinship worldview you yeah, know this this idea that everything has to be a dominant worldview um, where we're kind of going after each other's resources and killing for them. We, we want to share more information about sharing things, uh, sitting in nature as well, of course, um, caring about our surroundings. So that's, that's kind of the vibe, you know. If we can, if we can bring together an epic group of people here um, and reach, you know, I don't know, a few thousand people, that'd be great. Uh, obviously, without having 10,000 people sitting in my backyard. Well, I hope some of us can come over after the show. But, uh, like, let's, uh, yeah, before we get started, I just want to preface, uh, you know, this conversation, unlike a lot of other ones, is just a gathering of friends. I mean, no one here has been paid to be here. No one is sponsoring us. I um, mean, it's just, it's just us, man. And uh, that being said, I mean, I, I really uh, want to invite our first guest, uh, Beeple, along with fellow artist David Stein. Um, hey, I mean, hey Beeple, what up? Beeple really needs no introduction. What up, brother? <clears throat> Beeple, Beeple is uh, known as Mike Winkleman, for, for you guys that don't know. He's obviously one of the world's best-known artists. I would compare him, he's definitely on the level of Banksy, if not bigger. He's also a guy that just sold his NFT back in uh, March 2021 for $69 million. How does it feel to have sold an NFT for $69 million, Beeple? Uh, you know, it's pretty good. 
That's pretty good, actually. You're, a lot of people think that you would be surprised how many people think that would be a bad thing. I actually found it to be a pretty good thing, to be honest. I found it to be a pretty good feeling. <laughs> um, yeah, it's been, it's been a crazy ride, as the ride, uh, you know, even today, continues to be crazy. And, uh, yeah, super good to, to be talking to you guys and very much appreciate the opportunity here. So are you are you officially retired after that cell? Uh, yeah, I, I had a lot of people um, sort of ask if I was retired, and I did retire from sixty hour work weeks to ninety hour work weeks. So yeah, not really, not so much. I definitely have worked um, way more and way harder since then than I ever have in my life. So quite quite the opposite because i think it's it with uh you know this great sort of opportunity it feels i feel even more of an uh a sort of responsibility to not squander that opportunity and to do the best i can to sort of shine a light on this digital art community that i've been a part of for 20 years and now suddenly the eyes of the world are on, um, you know, and, and wanting to show the true sort of power of this medium to, you know, enlighten us and push everything forward. That's awesome, man. So, I mean, we're here talking about the blockchain and creativity. I mean, the world beyond cryptocurrency trading speculation, which obviously gets, you know, a lot of press. How are things with you? I mean, how's your sex life? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> How's everything Things going with good. you, man? It, yeah. it, what's up? Things are good. It's definitely it's it's been super busy and and very um, stressful at times. This is really kind of I would say my first cycle um, where we saw the the dizzying highs of 2021 to the um, at times very nerve-wracking lows and now it seems we are back on the sweet sweet up up upswing here so um yeah it's definitely been a roller coaster i i have a newfound appreciation for people who have been on this train for years and and even more you know sort of volatile swings than this yeah, I mean, I, we, you know, we have all been kind of noticing the market been looking really cool lately. I mean, I would assume, you know, that makes the environment you work in easier compared to when the market is down? Um, I don't know if it makes it easier necessarily. I think it, um, it just makes it move faster, maybe. Um, I think, I think to me, I'm very much kind of, focused on kind of very long term and and sort of um you know what i can do with this medium that's new and interesting and um sort of affects people again sort of beyond the, the speculation side of things so it's it it changes the energy a bit that people have towards it but for me personally on kind of like a day-to-day -day sort of like working basis it doesn't make that much of a difference in terms of sort of just creating art that's dope, that's man. dope man you uh i was noticing about your digital art death match is that kind of like the, i don't know if you've been to burning man but you know like there's a jousting camp there where everyone fights each other like tell us about the digital art death match and have you been sure. to burning man? so <laughs> so uh for those who don't know um I've got a studio in Charleston, South Carolina, which is a, a pretty big space. It's like 50,000 square feet, and we kind of have um, sort of a kind of white wall type gallery space with a bunch of work over the last kind of 20 years of my uh, artistic practice. And then we also have a immersive room that's, um, you know, like 15,000 square feet uh, that has, it, is sort of lined with uh, projectors and, and TVs columns with uh, that are wrapped with TVs and stuff. And so it's this very kind of like uh, digitally, you know, kind of futuristic immersive room that where you're surrounded by video. And so we've been having a number of different 
um, events in that space and sort of performances. And we did a CryptoPunks event last year. Um, and so the next event that we have is this digital art death match coming up in May. And what we wanted to do was put again, the focus more back on this, the actual production of this stuff and how could we use an immersive space like this to have kind of like performances or battles, like you were saying, um, you know, kind of in the, the jousting sense. And so, uh, we'll have a bunch of people, sort of making art live in the space and you'll be able to see all their screens projected all over and, and really kind of have like a fun sort of, um, you know, they do this a lot in, in sort of like graffiti in the like street art world where they do kind of like battles. Um, so that's kind of the, the, the next event that we have coming up here. Did you get up on there? Did you see the uh, ocean wide plaza in downtown LA? Did you see the three buildings? Did you get up on there? Um, no, I'm not seeing that. What is that? Yeah, the, in downtown LA, there was a Chinese developer who there's these three buildings next to in right in downtown next to the uh, big arena where the Lakers play, and there's all this graffiti artist that got up on there. So it's it's a really interesting thing to check oh, out. Oh, nice, very cool. Yeah, yeah, I think there's there's just a, a sort of like that spirit of kind of like collaboratively making art together and sort of like pushing each other to sort of like do our best. To me, that's what we wanted to kind of like bring into this very digital space so yeah excited about that and we've got a call for artists who want to show their work or possibly compete in the the sort of little tournament that we're going to have that day um so if you go to Beeple studios you can submit work there and we'd love to to show show your work regardless if you can come or not that's dope bro i mean a lot of people a lot of people are talking about there's going to be an ai narrative this cycle and i know you're involved with ai future art tell us more about that yeah, to me, I actually just did a very interesting piece of AI today. Um, it's, to me, I think AI is, is a very exciting tool, and I know there's a lot of apprehension in the sort of digital art community from commercial artists, but I think, to me, it's something that um, really just opens up a huge amount of possibilities and is not in any way going to replace artists. It will change how artists work and it will change the jobs that they do within art, but it is not going to replace artists. We all have phones in our pockets, or sorry, we all have cameras in our pockets. Everybody takes a bunch of pictures but everybody does not suddenly consider themselves a photographer. We still have photographers, and when you want a really good picture, you hire a photographer. And so that's what it's going to be with this. Everybody's going to have access to this, this tool. Everybody will use it, but you will still have artists who are able to utilize these tools in a deeper way to do more things than they could in the past. And so I think it's just going to allow people to be more expressive, more uh, nuanced, to, to do more. Um, and I think, to me, that's super, super exciting and very inspiring. That's dope, man. Are you familiar with the Spear in Vegas? I feel like that'd be such a really rad out, uh, you know, place to canvas your art. Yeah, that is definitely... Um, a super cool new venue, and I think it's they've they've shown a number of artists on there, um, and I think it's it's something that um, I, I think you're going to see more examples like that, and more like entire buildings wrapped with like LED screens, and and I think to me that's super exciting because I think those are ways that people can experience digital art in a more visceral fashion that I think gets them to understand the kind of like true power of this. So yeah, I've been to this fear. It's super cool. The inside of it is absolutely nuts um, too. So yeah, that's definitely uh, on the docket. That's awesome, man. And David Stein is up here with you right now. And we saw your launch with the project symbols, man. I mean, uh, I know you created your own alphabet. I don't know if you can recite the alphabet for us backwards right now, man, but how are you finding the change in the market, David? Okay. Not sure if David is there. We have some technical difficulties. I'll go back to you, people. Uh, hey, can you, can you hear me? Sorry about that. Uh, totally hey, fine. Did, did you hear my question? Can you repeat it, get you involved in this chat. <clears throat> can you repeat it, please? No, I was just saying, uh, you know, we saw your launch with the, the, the your own little alphabet with symbols during the last bull run. 
I was going to ask you to recite that if you could recite the alphabet backwards, but I don't know if you. <laughs> but uh, are you? How are you finding the change in the market right now? Um, you know, I, I uh, I'm working on on the fine art aspect of of the project. I I came to, I came to uh, the NFT space a little bit um, a little bit late, um, but you know, I thought that it was the most perfect platform to build and rally a community around a creative project. And, uh, and we did that and it gave me sort of, um, uh, the gumption to come out with, with the alphabet. This is something that, uh, I wanted to put out into the world for over, over 10 years. And, and it really, you know, it allowed me, uh, the, the space allowed me to, uh, to put it out and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm following what's going on and, and, you know, hoping for a, uh, a turnaround, but while, while, <clears throat> you know, while the market is in a downturn, I'm, I'm still kind of, uh, you know, progressing on the fine art doing shows. I just got back from Mexico city art week, had a great show there. And, and, um, yeah, I think, I think that, uh, uh, you know, <clears throat> the the overall sentiment uh, on on the space um, you know need, needs needs to change um, and uh, you know I think for that to happen uh, there needs to be some like real u utility um, around um, around NFTs um, but yeah that's awesome man. Yeah, you were talking about the market. I wanted to go back to people for, um, I know, you know, I'm not gonna put you on the spot, man, you know, about what tokens you're holding, but I did, did notice you're on the board of Render. Can you, can you tell me more about that? Yeah, so Render is made by Otoy, and that is the, the software that I use every day to make the everyday. So basically, the, the, the 3D package that I use is called Cinema 4D, um, and in that, uh, program I composed the scene, but then the actual rendering is done through uh, a program called Octane Render, and that is made by Otoy. and And this is a piece of software that has been kind of the, you know, sort of backbone workhorse of my workflow for ten years now, um, and something that you know literally I use every day. And they also have a render network where they have a decentralized um, sort of cluster of GPUs that can be used to render uh, projects, sort of similar to AWS, except AWS is all Amazon, and this is kind of anybody can sort of like connect to this and use their sort of idle GPU time. Instead of mining, they can use it for rendering other people's projects. And now they've exploded even more with obviously the, the AI boom, um, being able to basically do AI computations, um, you know, through this network as well. So I think these, these sort of, uh, this decentralized network of, of sort of like GPUs to me is, is super, super interesting. And so, yeah, excited to see where that goes. Yeah, Mike, it's, it's Rocco here and thanks for, thanks for being on. Um, I was looking at render a while ago, um, pro probably, you know, hand on heart from a specs point of view of what's this thing going to do is it going to gain value which is obviously has has done pretty well recently but i think the um you know as you mentioned the utility element of it um as well as you know your good self being on the board and ari emmanuel or advisory board sorry and people like ari um that just signals to me that there are actually some crypto projects out there now that really do have a, a use for the future yeah, definitely. I think to me, uh, you know, this is, is exciting because it was, uh, again, a, a project that, or a company that I used and, and was very integral to, you know, my artistic practice well before all the sort of like crypto stuff. And I think Jules is obviously, you know, a genius and, and sort of having the foresight to see that these clusters of GPUs that, you know, if people did this, they could make sort of more money, you know, using their GPU to render stuff versus mining, I think was, was incredible foresight. And then obviously, you know, uh, GPUs have exploded in sort of uh, usefulness now with our 
insatiable uh, thirst for AI, which I believe honestly will only go up in the future as we as people see more and more use cases for this and like generating an image for something just becomes something that's you know done you do 10 times a day without even thinking about it so uh, i really think uh it, it's super interesting to to sort of be a part of, of what they're building there because they're you know building things that are actually really sort of like useful and, and cutting edge from a, a graphic design standpoint yeah cool i mean I, I the way i see it we're all gonna have you know much smaller versions of the the apple headset on and be walking around with stuff popping out of buildings and adverts and everything else which is going to terrorize everyone <laughs> but there's obviously going to be a greater use for uh for that kind of processing yeah for sure i think uh i think there's from you know kind of obviously you know chat gpt type uses to machine sort of uh vision i think that's going to be another massive sort of like use case for this um and i think also, as we start wearing headsets like that, and we start, like, I believe in the future, we will be recording pretty much everything that we see at some point. I think it will just stop being like, oh, I record things once in a while, to literally it's just recording all the time. Um, then processing that just gargantuan amounts of data. Um, I, I, I just think there's so many use cases for this. I think... Uh, I think about simple things like think about a bunch of, you know, kids who are in a group chat and they're all sending each other these GIFs. I don't think that's how it will be in the future. I think they will be sending themselves little AI generated um, images that are of them and their friends in all these situations. And so you'll have a bunch of kids who will just be sitting there chatting with their friends and they'll be just smashing these fucking GPUs generating hundreds of images that are completely disposable just because why the fuck not? And like, they won't think anything of it. And so I, I think we will see just more and more use cases for, for AI and generative, you know, sort of like art and video and music um, uh, that I think we're just at the absolute sort of, you know, beginning of. Yeah. I mean, we've been, since the um, pandemic, we've been looking at, we were looking at how to put on shows from from the recording studio, so you'd be able to, you know, be making a record, walk outside, and then broadcast to people. Which obviously traditionally would have just been a YouTube thing, but I mean, with the headsets, there's the opportunity there to have people feel like they're actually sitting in the middle of the desert, right in front of you know any any one of the artists that we have doing an acoustic set. And obviously within that realm as well, there's a there's an element of graphics and and uh, I suppose commerce as well um but it, it feels like it's going to become a part of things i think the, the question is just how we do it in a way that's kind of inverted commas healthy and you know keeps us as being humans rather than just sort of you know half half man half machine yeah i think that's going to certainly be a challenge because i think yeah. these things are going to be very you know, again, once they're in a form factor that you could wear all the time, I think they are going to be very compelling. And the idea, just like now, the idea of leaving the house without your phone, oh my God, you don't have your phone with you, you're naked to the world, like nobody does that. <laughs> like you wouldn't, yeah. you wouldn't dare think of leaving the house without your precious fucking cell phone. And so I, I think... That will be even more so when these glasses become something that you could actually, you know, feasibly wear all the time. Yeah. I mean, it feels good when you actually, when you do forget it. <laughs> I know. But, uh, it's like, but that doesn't happen too often anymore. Let's be yeah. <laughs> well, when I, was, I was, when I was reading about your background, I was like, wow, Beeple's two years younger than me. I, I was born June 21st. But I'm from, a, from an era where, you know, you call your friend up and say, meet me at seven at the pub. Yeah. And if they weren't there, that was it. You weren't going to find them, you know. No. <laughs> yeah, I miss, I I miss feel, the old I days. Feel, I feel very fortunate to have lived at least part of my life before the internet and sort of like cell phones. So you have yeah. some appreciation that this is not how it always was. Versus right. kids today, my kids growing up, like they have no... Like, they're just going to, like, completely take these things for granted. Just like, you know, I took having a microwave or having TV for granted. Um, 
but I think it's it's you know super. It, it's very hard to to imagine that mindset when this is like all you know. This like crazy, crazy abundance of of information and media and and just immediate access. Yeah, yeah. Again, I mean, I feel like that's you know the next forty years. Once once all the post World War Two babies have retired or graduated. It's going to be kind of handed over to us as there you go. We you know brought the world on pretty nicely for you, and now you can try and try and steer us into the next uh, the next chapter. Yeah, yeah, we're kind of screwed. I mean, the old days were great. I mean, we had we met people in person. You had you you would connect with people. They weren't looking at they weren't looking online to see what you've done in the past. You just kind of organically got to know people. It was kind of cool. Yeah. yeah, those days are over. Those days are very much over. <laughs> well, we got to live it. We got to live it. That was pretty cool. I wanted to ask David a quick question about his Symbols project. Um, where can people learn more about that, David? Um, you can uh, you can follow it through, uh, obviously, my, uh, my X profile, but also Symbols.io and... My Instagram, which is my name uh, with ITS in front of it, it's David Stein. Awesome, dude. And we have so many amazing guests right now. I wanted to get them involved here. Um, we, you know, we just heard from Beeple and David Stein. I know we have, you know, Shibatoshi and Brock and Ape Water and, and all these other wonderful people. Gage, Billboard, do you guys have any questions for our guests? I wanted to let you feel free to chime in. Well, I, I think uh, this is Brock. It's worth at least pointing out that, uh, you know, Bitcoin had hit $63,000 <laughs> in the last couple hours, you know, since we're having a, a crypto <laughs> conversation, um, probably just worth a mention that we're, uh, you know, we might be seeing an all-time high relatively soon at this rate. But are you thinking that's good or bad? Because with past cycles, don't you think, Brock, the halving has dictated, usually, isn't it true that most of the market's gone up after the halving? This is, this is not normal, right? Well, I mean, I would say that as we've watched cycles, markets become better at predicting those cycles. And if the happening has driven, you know, price appreciation and that's becoming a predictable trend, of course, people are going to bet on it. But there's other events going on right now, like the ETFs being live, uh, meaning greater accessibility and access to buying Bitcoin through channels that allow traditional institutions and retail you know, public market investors to, to more easily buy Bitcoin. So I think there's a number of things going on uh, that are causing us to see this appreciation leading up to the happening, which is in 52 days. I love it. Yeah. I mean, you are an expert in, I was just about to introduce you and Billy to the show um, right now. Um, if you have any other questions, I know people in, and um, David were, were just joining us. And um, if you have any more questions for them, you know, feel free to chime in. And I'm going to move on to you guys right here if you don't have any questions. Okay, great. Well, people and David, listen, man, we really appreciate you. Feel free to stick around. Just wanted to introduce the next part of the show. Um, Billy, you're the guy credited with creating Dogecoin. How does that feel, man? I mean, uh, you, uh, I got you and I got Brock here, the creator of EOS. Um, he is also uh, one of the founding members, even though he is not a member of Tether anymore. I wanted to get you guys up to the uh, front. How are how's, 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 how you guys doing? Yeah, I think this is a funny panel for me to be on because I think I'm the only poor person up here. <laughs> so you're, what are you saying, that you, don't, you, you didn't make it with Doge? No, no, the Doge was released fairly, so I just mined with everyone else. And I think I had something like 6 million Doge at most, and I gave a lot of that away. And then, yeah, I eventually sold it for like 10 grand. So, not really. <laughs> I mean, you are credited with creating the number one meme. It's, I mean, isn't that kind of like writing the Bible? I mean, wh wh what's, what's up with these days? Where are you living at? What are you up to? No, I'm just a, a working person. I, I work a regular software engineering job. And uh, just ship post on the side, I guess. Wow, you're a pretty humble guy. We, I mean, we see all the de degeneracy out there. I mean, there's got to be stuff beyond that, right? I mean, is or is it all just speculation? Can the blockchain have more to offer? Well, I think that my like I'm for crypto. I'm like skeptic isn't quite the right word. Like I still enjoy it, but 
I think people show utility by what they do with it. And if it was useful in particular ways, people would do it. People would use it for those ways. But, you know, like in the beginning for Bitcoin, people were really into like, oh, we can spend this. We can do all this stuff that's going to replace the dollar. And we see that that's not a thing. You can't really spend Bitcoin to buy like little micro things that cost a lot for uh, any transaction. So, you know, it, the primary use case of Bitcoin and all of the cryptocurrencies and all of the derivatives of cryptocurrencies is speculation because that is what people are doing with it, what people want to do with it, and how people approach these new things. Um, but it doesn't mean in the future it can't be bigger, uh, although it has been quite a while where these texts have been out and people are still just speculating with them for the most part. Brock, curious, you know, I mean, I know you were the co-founder of EOS. I know you had transferred your ownership of Tether, and I know you're an avid Burning Man attendee, child actor, you ran for president, now you're running Puerto Rico. I mean, what, what, what's your thoughts on what he just said? Well, I'm definitely not running Puerto Rico, but uh, <laughs> the rest of those things are true. Um, uh, well, I, I mean, I, first of all, let's talk about sort of meme coins, culture coins, or what I would say is really a community coin in some ways. And what Doge did, you know, not being differentiated in terms of, you know, having any technical advantages, it built something really cool, something really approachable that ultimately galvanized a lot of community behind it. And then uh, obviously we're here on X. Uh, uh, Elon Musk, you know, took it not maybe to Mars, but took it to the moon. And um, so that's that piece of it in terms of Bitcoin, in terms of. It being a purely speculative instrument, I think it's worth, I think, better describing what Bitcoin, you know, is. It's uh, uh, an alternative asset class that looks a lot like digital gold, uh, uh, a hedge against, call it, concerns. And yes, there's speculation, just like with any, you know, commodity or uh, investable asset. And, um, you know, Bitcoin obviously being uh, uh, the king you know, has, has benefited greatly from, you know, the world becoming more informed about what money is, how it works, its origins, and, you know, people looking for alternative systems at times of great uncertainty, which is, you know, for anyone paying attention, a lot of alarming stuff going on. Uh, well, at the same time, we've never lived in a period of time with greater optimism and hope, right? Uh, you know, we've got technology that is, you know, life has never been better on this planet despite it still being terrible in some places and for, you know, some large groups of people. And, you know, and technology continues to provide incredible solutions. I mean, we're living in the most amazing period in history. And, uh, you know, I, for one, am grateful to, to be here and to be able to play with these tools to innovate, you know, other uses of that technology. I mean, people was just, you know, talking about digital art and welcome to NFTs. I mean, if you've been a digital artist, you've, you know, had to work as a graphic designer or work on games or, you know, whatever it is, now you can actually take your creative output and there's a market for it because it's got a limited number. In the same way that people buy physical art, you know, digital art now can have value and it's recognized and acknowledged and it's created a, you know, a creator economy allowing an entire genre of, you know, artists and creators to be financially remunerated, to make money off of the things that they create, which is just a wonderful thing to see. Um, you know, I, you know, in terms of where that market's going, we started here in Puerto Rico, the first, uh, NFT gallery, uh, called the lighthouse to give people the experience because most art collectors, you know, don't want to like go into a virtual gallery that they have to show off their collection or get their friends to do that, uh, or hang out in open sea or whatever it might be, but to create an experience where digital art can be seen on digital canvases. I've got a couple of them in my house here right now. It's uh, made by Wim. And, uh, you know, I think that, you know, digital art having value, the creators of it being uh, able to be rewarded for their creations. And, and then those of us having the ability to display it in the analog world, I call it the brick and pixel sort of model that came from, you know, Crystal, who, uh, you know, where the digital and the analog worlds meet. I think what we're seeing there with real world assets which is effectively, you know, what made NFTs possible, but it doesn't have to be just NFTs. It can be, you know, anything. Uh, so I think there's uh, a lot of interesting use cases of this technology, though it takes time for those seeds that are planted to ultimately be adopted and bear fruit. That's dope, man. 
I wanted to ask you and Billy the same question. I mean, you saw what the president of El Salvador is doing with Bitcoin. Do you guys think that we should do that? And I know you guys are both, you're in Puerto Rico, Brock. I don't know where you are, Billy, but do you guys think we should be doing that in the U.S.? Well, make, uh, making it, le- let's be specific about what it is. So what the president of El Salvador, President Bukele, did is he made Bitcoin legal tender, to be specific, saying... Uh, the acknowledging its uh, its role as a government in it being legal tender that it is another form of money just like a foreign currency in El Salvador. That's the the legal thing that happened. I led the first formal delegation into El Salvador since COVID, bringing thirty five of you know call it industry executives that could assist the government of El Salvador, President Bukele, in implementing that law in ninety days. And it's taken what is a small country, and uh, uh, it's one of the things that has made President Bukele a, call it a world leader and uh, widely recognized for saying yes to the future. And uh, the ETF, I think, is probably the biggest, best thing that's happened to the U.S. in terms of its recognition of this at a governmental level and allowing that through the SEC and a regulator to, to, to say yes to this. You know, what made America great is the ingenuity of the American people. We've been the capital of innovation. And this technology is certainly playing a role in the world that's changing. And this is one at least big positive step forward where the regulatory uncertainty in the United States at least has less ambiguity now. Wow. Yeah, I, I guess I would say in general, like, I can talk about what I would like rather than what I think would be good for the world because that's way above my pay grade. But what I would like is to be able to just use Bitcoin or any of these cryptocurrencies to buy stuff like without having to do all this annoying tax shit and i think in general the taxes uh, is what makes bitcoin so annoying to use in the united states is if i want to buy something i have to like calculate my gains and losses at the exact moment uh depending on when i got it and whatever and it's just such a pain in the ass so i think i'm mostly interested like uh, the art stuff is cool but it's like such a small subset of generally rich bros trading stuff so i think I'm more interested in like the use case for, you know, regular person. Uh, and yeah, like just being able to spend it and use it as money, I think would be really nice. Yeah. I mean, that's why we need Brock for president. Brock, you lower our taxes, right? <laughs> um, I, I think that it's less about lowering taxes and it's more about restructuring the entire tax code. Uh, my, my one comment yeah. on this is our tax system is so complicated that you couldn't take a group of tax attorneys and CPAs into a room and have even that entire group knowing the entire thing without having to reference documents. If there's no one on earth that knows the tax code in its entirety, how is it as we the people are expected to be able to abide by it? Ignorance of the law is no excuse. I'd say the bigger thing is how do you simplify things uh, to create a system that is ultimately more fair? I think the, you know, the, the short answer that politicians use to you know, raise taxes, you know, on the rich so we can give more to the poor or just lower taxes so that the rich have more, I think is a, is a simplistic uh, argument that doesn't actually solve the problem. I completely agree. That's why we need you in office, man. We got to get these establishment politicians out, man. How do people, how do we get someone like you in office? I mean, you know, you have the Bobby Kennedys, the Vivics. Who are you? I mean, not to go off topic, but I mean, what, what do you, do you want to get rid of the two-party system? What should we do? I mean, well, I think that's, I think what you just said, a two-party system is a system that by nature polarizes. You know, it's, you've got two sports teams, effectively political sports teams, one red, one blue, and it creates tribalism and it creates separation where we're ultimately all in this together. It's a Venn diagram that mostly overlaps. We argue about tactics, but our country's divided and more polarized and divided than ever. Uh, and so I do think that, you know, ending the two-party system might not be uh, ending two parties, but creating new options. The last, uh, the, the last third-party uh, candidate or non-two-party candidate to become president of the United States was Abraham Lincoln. And he did it by creating a coalition of rivals, you know, which is like not everybody has to agree on everything. Building, you know, a better system that involves more diversity of thought and views uh, you know, is what Abraham Lincoln did, and I think that uh, at some point it's inevitable. It has to happen, and if ever it was going to happen, it's in an election cycle like this, where you know I think Americans in general don't like reruns. You know, uh, uh, we don't want syndicated content. We want new material, and uh, we have a rematch of 2020. Um, uh, 
RFK Jr. running, I think, creates an interesting alternative. Uh, call it a middle way and gives people uh, another option. And I think more options in general is a good thing. And uh, he's doing well enough, you know, this early in the cycle that there's something, you know, we could see real change if enough people believe it and actually show up and exercise their civic responsibility and vote for what they want versus voting against what they don't want. I just wanted to say, pick up on something, um, Billy. You know, you said that a lot, a lot of it's for for rich people trading and doing whatever. But you know, it'd be nice to be able to use crypto um, for things that you want to buy. And obviously, you know, part of the narrative of the last bull run, I guess, was all the excitement around: Is Elon going to do this? Is he going to do that? And I'm sure that you probably felt a lot of pressure with people saying, "What's going on?" When you when you probably didn't know. Um, but I mean, do you see do you see something um, like Doge or like Bitcoin or anything else being part of a network like X as being a positive thing for people to be able to transact or to tip or to pay their friends back and stuff like that? I mean, I'm, I'm sort of wondering what your your sort of bigger outlook is for for crypto and what you'd like to see happening. Yeah, I think a couple of things. And like, I'm I'm an outsider. Like, I haven't done anything with crypto in terms of building or, or programming on it since 2014 so it's, it's always funny when people want me to do stuff and like I'm not doing anything <laughs> leave me alone type thing uh, but in terms of like what I always thought was interesting about crypto is I, I'm really into video games and virtual worlds and I played World of Warcraft for a very unhealthy amount of time growing up so like, having these virtual economies is really interesting. Having these virtual worlds is really interesting. And for someone like me who grew up, like, super introverted, uh, a lot of my friends were online. So, you know, meeting them on these games and stuff kind of brought them to life. So I did actually think the metaverse concept was cool. Although what people, again, were doing with it was just speculating on fake metaverse land and, and monkey pictures and whatever. So it's, like, a little bit less interesting uh, than an actual use case of, like, you know, a whole world where people actually have ownership of their stuff and you know the, the, that vision i think is far in the future um but i think that stuff could be cool and then in terms of tipping uh, doge was originally uh way back in 2014 it was the most tip currency on reddit so if you went on reddit and you had a funny post someone would give you like five thousand doge and be like huh oh, and I thought that was fun, and Doge was worth basically nothing at that point, so people were just kind of tossing it around, and it just kind of made for a, a fun, more engaging uh, way of using the internet, and then once it started becoming worth a lot more money, then it got a lot more chaotic and a, a lot less fun. So, yeah, of course. You know, this is a little balance between, like, greed and, and these bad actors kind of coming to the space to take advantage of people and actual use cases that are fun and uh, bring up the average person, I guess. Yeah. I mean, it seems like, you know, the at the core of your sensibility or your sense of humor or the things that you cared about, that's what you put into it at the beginning, which I, I don't think should ever be undervalued. You know, that's a, that's a massive moment um, that shouldn't be forgotten. Um, I was thinking as well that, you know, in terms of, you, you know, you're obviously working on for other people, for software and, and continuing to do what you've always done. I'm sure that at some point, and you know, someone like Brock would know about this. Um, that there's a an avenue for you to be out there speaking to to rooms full of people and explaining what this thing was was created as. Um, so maybe that's a, a side conversation to be to be had down the line between the two of you now that you know each other. Well, Billy, uh, I, I guess quick question for you, since you know I ended up in this space. <laughs> Um, well, because of my friendship with Rocco, but um, uh, specifically World of Warcraft and, and all of those, call it early metaverses or massively multiplayer online games. When you were playing World of Warcraft, did you use like Wowhead and Thoughtbot uh, or Alex and Sam? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I owned all of those. Uh, all of those. I, 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 I owned all that <laughs> stuff. And so, oh, really? Yeah. That's, that's and awesome. so sold that to, to Tencent, uh, but also ran all the secondary markets. I know I facilitated over a billion dollars of World of Warcraft gold sales. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the gold sale economy was uh, very dystopian, but also, you know, supply and demand, like literal supply and demand. So it was, uh, it, one, one of the things I wanted early, because in 2014, when Doge was popular, 
uh, and I was still playing World of Warcraft, I wanted a some type of currency to be able to trade uh, in between games. So, like, you have this, like, you know, uh, internet currency or whatever, and then if you want to get money in the new MMO instead of your WoW money, you could, like, trade your WoW money for that money. But, you know, that never quite came to be, but... Or, or maybe it was in, in some... Very well, that I knew nothing about. Maybe that was Bitcoin <laughs> in terms of like, yeah. you know, uh, but yeah, that's what we did is we facilitated, you know, when you were exiting a game, uh, Brendan Bloomer, because uh, I, I also didn't create EOS, I was one of the founders of Block One. Uh, 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 Brendan Bloomer, who was the CEO of Block One, uh, ran, when he, when he turned 18, he had been working, you know, with, with my company for a while. But he was in the market of buying and selling game accounts. So when you were done with, you know, World of Warcraft and you wanted to leave, you know, you basically resell your skin so someone else could jump into your character. And uh, uh, he was in that space. And I said, well, skip Stanford scholarship, come move to Hong Kong and run my uh, skins business, my game accounts business. <laughs> and that's how, you know, Brendan and I started formally working together uh, 2004 or five. Uh, and so it was a bunch of the old IGE team out of Hong Kong, uh, which was a lot of the... Uh, the yeah, I bought from IGE. I remember it was just some, like, level one elf came and gave me a bunch of money. I'm like, yeah, so I'm the, I was the founder of IGE, amongst other things. That's cool. I, g I gave you some money. <laughs> <laughs> Long time ago. <laughs> so, you know, one of the things that happens a lot at the ranch, out of the recording studios, which really is in the middle of nowhere... Um, is we always have these epic people together and, and people kind of find that they have a lot, of, a lot of things in common and that common interests and common things in the past. And I, I do hope that everybody on this panel and actually everyone in this group has a chance to, to be a part of that more extensively, you know, stay in touch and, and see what can, can become from this. Um, I was sort of looking at the overall arc of the, the conversation and it seems like, you know, we do have more beyond cryptocurrencies and the speculative market stuff that's going on all the time, which kind of determines, you know, the, the news cycle builds itself off of it. And, you know, people go, oh, the blockchain's dead. And I, I find myself sitting there going, the blockchain is definitely not dead. It does, it can't die by, by fact. Um, you know, and it's, I'm finding it interesting that, you know, you, as you say, Brock, that you have, a, you now have a creative outlet for people like people, David Stein, many, many other artists, through that network, you know, we've also got gaming as, as something that you two are discussing. I know also, Brock, and maybe you can tell us a little bit about it, that you've created, a, um, a, I guess, a charitable arm with, with a dollar a day um, donation. Is that something you could tell us a little more about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I do tons of stuff in innovation and more stuff that we could take us a day to get through it. But um, uh, one of the projects that I'm just really excited about in terms of, you know, ultimately, I, 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 I've always said that, you know, a billionaire isn't someone with a billion dollars, but someone who's positively impacting the lives of a billion people. What are we doing? Why are we doing it? And what are we hoping to achieve? And hopefully it's to build a better world uh, that can ultimately work for everyone to some degree, right? Um, and so the Dollar Donation Club, and I'll throw the link in here, is uh, the idea of giving a dollar a day, a dollar a week, a dollar a month, a dollar once, you know, more if you can, more if you like. And uh, created the, the company, Seth Blaustein uh, uh, is the founder. I was the main investor supporting him during this build. Uh, is uh, Humanities Checklist, Transparent Systems, Experts, and How Do You Build the World's Largest Collective Philanthropist, you know, where... You know, it's many hands makes uh, light work. And, uh, and so it's a, it's a cool project. Super excited about it. Uh, the next, uh, you know, minimally viable product's all kind of done. It's been tested and tested and tested. And, uh, you know, we should be hopefully really starting to push, uh, push things, you know, over the course of this year and with the next product launch uh, in the next couple months. Uh, I'm, I'm just excited about it. You know, I, I'm always like, how do you get people to give? And, you know, it starts with a buck. With everything going on in the world, like, I mean, th do you give a buck? <laughs> I yeah. give a buck. No, it's, it's really funny that you should mention that because back in uh, 2014, maybe, I registered, I think I still got it, giveabuck.com. And uh, it, was, it was built around this idea that if everyone just gave a dollar, it would solve, solve a lot of problems, you know. Um, so if you need a URL, I can, I can, uh, you know, maybe we can have a chat. <laughs> um, but, uh, 
I think that's really important as as just something that, you know, has always been a, a thing for me as well is that, you know, a small number of people with, with massive outreach can actually create a significant change if, if everyone's part of that idea and part of the same, you know, part of the same mindset or, or group of people that think the same way. Um, so I think that's really cool. And if you, you know, if you would share more about that in the, Maybe yeah, I just, section. I, just dropped, I just dropped it with a referral link. I've got by far the most referrals of anybody on the platform, probably times 10 right now. <laughs> cool. All right. So it's gamified. I'm, I'm in. Count me in. Oh, yeah. By, by the way, and, and it's, one, it's, it's like a video game. It's totally gamified. And as, as you're signing up and planting trees or pulling plastic out of the ocean, you know, you log in. It's got all your game sounds. It's like leveling up. It's, uh, it's, it, it's the right sort of thing to make giving fun and... Uh, uh, yeah, gamified. It's awesome. Cool, dude. I, I'm done with gamifying everything. I like. I started this like crazy exercise thing just because I got an Apple Watch and it like kind of gamified exercising and would like make little achievements when you did stuff. And that was just enough to get me to actually like stop being a couch potato and exercise. <laughs> so gamifying anything that's actually good for you, I think, is a good thing. I mean, Billy, I'm I'm guessing with your network of a couple of million followers, you could probably get get a few people on board with Brock's Give a Buck project as well <laughs> yeah if, if that's what they want to give him a run like, for his money i, mean, I, I don't just, you know put you two up against each other so you can get the most most and by the way it would make me very happy <laughs> if somebody pushed this and was able to uh uh be the largest referral uh and 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 i, I it's, it's boring being at the top <laughs> <laughs> and, and by the way we run we run faster and we run better when there's good co-opetition right yeah, that's true. I mean, that's actually something when I mentioned the kinship worldview, you know, the tribes, they used to, it wasn't about winning the game. It was about having a good game, you know, and that's a, that's a very different thing. Um, actually just reminded me just completely out of the left field, but we've been doing a lot of work with um, Seminole Tribe of Florida who own Hard Rock and they're actually looking at doing a, a fishing tournament, but for plastic. So seeing who can pull the most plastic out of the ocean. So that could also be, if you're working in that area, good, a good little connection. Um, but anyway, without getting getting too far away from it all, I know that Robbie was going to ask if any of the, the panel members, um, yeah, and I see that Mike's still here, had any questions for Brock and Billy before we before we move on. Yeah, before I, yeah, we want to get the panel involved. If you guys have any questions for Brock or Billy, any of you guys up there, people, any of you guys, I, I really wanted to actually, off a side note too, because I know Brock's a good guy for this. I, I'm curious what everyone else thinks, you know, all of you guys about communities, starting communities. I mean, we, you know, Brock had kind of, kind of lit a, a light bulb in my head. Like we, we're all living in the matrix. We're all kind of going day to day, following the rules, regulations. I mean, what happens if we were to start, or maybe Brock, do you know, would you ever start a community or are you starting communities or is anyone else here would they ever been in interested in starting a community where you, you have acres of land and you invite all your cool friends there and you say, listen, if, if someone has all the money in the world, couldn't they just say, okay, stop your job right now, come live here, it's all good energy, no, lie, no lying, no cheating, no stealing, you get extradited from the community, we all have different arts and we trade. Is that something that would resonate that you can kind of get away from and start your own community and, and start this whole like perfect utopia? I, I did my first test about eight years ago in, in Ibiza or Ibiza. Uh, we bought a, a farm uh, and started putting a community together of a bunch of, you know, really interesting people in the crypto community to experiment first with this concept and what governance looks like and what rules look like and how do you go through that process. Uh, so, yeah, I've, I've been doing community experiments for, for some time and, uh, you know, I'm a big fan of it. And so eventually, yes, someone's going to build you know, uh, uh, I'm not sure anything's going to be exactly a utopia, but, you know, build a better system. Yeah, I mean, I just feel like some of these people have so much money and everyone's struggling. Everyone's, you know, paying, you know, they're having their jobs to survive. And if they say, OK, bro, so quit your job right now. I will give you 100 grand a year. I'm a billionaire. Come to my land. We will all live in harmony. Anyone who breaks the rules is leaving. It's all good vibes, good energy. I know it sounds crazy, but I think it could be possible. That's all I'm saying. Sounds a little like a cult. <laughs> I mean, like cult. It, 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 it's a vibe, and I'm, you know, <laughs> all, all about the good vibes and a, a community that, you know, can, you know, keep in that kind of harmony or at least bounce back, right? You get triggered, you know, triggers are the guides and, you know, you know, get right back up again and, you know, keep, keep, keep the good vibration. I think I mean, it's cool I, to do something like that virtually too for for people who 
don't want to invest as much and move, but still want to be part of something bigger, like have a, you know, virtual, you put on your, uh, I guess, uh, Apple Pros would be, might be too expensive for everybody, but put on your MetaQuest or whatever and jump in and hang out with everybody. I mean, you'd be the number one philanthropist in the world if you had a billion dollars and you said, listen, I'm going to take 500 of my closest friends. I'm going to give you 100 grand a year. You're going to come here, live nine months out of the year. We're going to build this perfect community. You're not going to live in this world anymore. You can still go back to your family, have them visit. I don't know. It just seems like a really, we're, we're, you know, we're conforming to the world, you know? Yeah. I mean, sure, you just need one person like you there, and then it's automatically not a cult. Uh, I mean, that's like one of the things that's got me so hyped <laughs> already about this panel is that like, there's a lot of people here with different views, but sort of back to what you said in the beginning, there's a lot of similarities we have as people, right? And having the different views is actually what makes something like this panel so cool. Like someone being a little bit more skeptical versus someone being a little bit more bullish. Um, but you know, we're all still here cohesively talking, not yelling at each other. Like that's what makes it not a cult is, you know, is having someone there to be like, Hey, let's not just be an echo chamber. Um, and yeah, those kind of vibes in this panel is just absolutely awesome. Yeah, I, th I appreciate that, Gates. And, you know, it's it's really about bringing together really awesome people and then figuring out what are we going to do next? You know, what what's coming next? How do we look at the world that it is? And, um, you know, what do we what do we design to make it better? Because I think I was, I was talking to a friend of mine the other day and they said, well, you know, everybody thinks that everyone's thinking differently. But if you actually really had a chat with people, you probably find that most of us think think the same way, you know. And there's this kind of continual information stream that is arguably pretty, it's, it's pretty full on right now. It's definitely not a kind of level, you know, take care of each other kind of vibe. But there may come a moment where, you know, we can lean into that more. Um, and that's, I mean, that at least is what we kind of hope for from Escape in terms of, you know, what, what we provide in terms of an environment for people to come and create and to take care of themselves and to talk about how do we connect better with the people that are into the stuff that we create, right? So, um, you yeah, know, I'm, I'm really happy that you mentioned that, and thank you. Um, yeah, I think anything that makes people creative and opens up their creativity is a good thing. So it sounds like uh, Escape or, or whatever. It's, I don't know much about, but it sounds like it could be a place for that. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's, that's kind of the idea. You find, find something magical, create a comfortable space for people, and then, and then let them receive the magic, right? Receive the ideas. It could be a business idea. It could be the next great song. It could be the next tech idea. It could be any, any number of things. But to get that, it helps a lot if you're sitting somewhere um, a little more quiet. You know, it's, it's much harder when you're in the, in the city or you're in the middle of the grind trying to find it. Um, and again, I feel lucky that I just ended up in the, in the middle of the desert, honestly, which is, is the idea is to share it from there. Um, but also to encourage people that are still stuck in the grind and finding, you know, wh whatever it is, whatever's going on in your day, to say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm happy to be your mate. If I can dial you into this, you know, Billy, if you're, if you're finding that you're having to work really hard, and I know that you're in San Francisco and that things can be pretty tough there, which I, I had no idea, like, the, the level of what was going on um, in terms of the home situation yeah. until I was there the other day and I was, I was actually staying right in the middle of it, I guess on market street. Um, oh, and yeah, that's no good I don't know. I was just like, I, I can't, I mean, I, I won't go down a rabbit hole right now, but I was so shocked by how some people are living in the, and the lot that they have in their life that all I could think about was how do we, you know, how, how, how are we going to improve that? I mean, how has that become a thing? Um, but anyway, I, w I won't go too far because it obviously kind of knocked me sideways the whole thing. But, you know, <laughs> if you're there doing your thing and you're working really hard and you're a good dude, which it seems like you are, and, you know, your heart's in the right place and you've worked really hard to create something that honestly has made a lot of people very happy. There's, there's a lot of stuff about Doge that's really funny and brought people together. Then, you know, my version of that is if there's anything cool that we can do with Billy, let's, let's do it. Let's see how we can bring that together. And I think that's a, a big part of what escape is. And, and just to finish, I, I feel like it's the reason that we had this crazy response in three days that suddenly literally every person that I sent a message to was like, yeah, I'm into that. I'll be there. I, I mean, I was totally blown away. So, um, yeah, again, thank you to everybody for, for taking a minute and being here. Um, I know that, uh, 
Robbie, I'm going to hand back over to you, but I know that we're moving into talking with um, some more of our creative friends, um, and uh, I'll let you introduce everybody. Let's get them all involved, but I mean, Billy, have you kn- I just have to ask a question, because I, mean, I know there's a poop patrol in San Francisco, and I hate to bring that topic up, but have, you, have they walked by your house? It, wait, what, uh, have I had poop walk by my house? <laughs> <laughs> no, there, San Francisco has a, a specific... Uh, team of people that clean up feces around the city do you you weren't uh, you didn't hear about that uh well yes they do uh, but yeah I, I moved out of san francisco a little south because i just couldn't stand it as a as a renter and like i don't know like it's it's a beautiful place in a lot of places i went to the school gate park uh, last weekend i was like oh yeah san francisco is beautiful and then i was driving back uh next to market on mission and got stuck in traffic and some dude was just peeing on everyone's car and I was like, okay. <laughs> You've had your car it's broken into. I, will, I mean, everyone I know who's been to San Francisco has had their car broken into. Multiple times. Yeah. Yeah. Is what anyway, it's a real travesty. Yeah. Hopefully we can clean it up. I know I know, Biden cleaned it up for Xi Jinping, but he won't clean it up for the citizens. That's a whole other topic <laughs> that it's really frustrating for friends who live there. I'm like, okay, you'll clean it up for the Chinese dictator, but not for the people of San Francisco. It's kind of frustrating. Is what it is. Moving but yeah, on. I mean, I want to get everyone involved and bring some more people up here. And, and, you know, I want you guys to all have conversations with each other. But I want to introduce uh, some of our other guests. Um, we have Doug DeLuca. He's an EP for a national talk show. Um, we have Dallas Austin, who's Woo-hoo! produced for artists such as TLC, Boys to Men, and Madonna. He's also the founder of Dad Distribution. And we have Etai, man. Etai, bro. I love your water, bro. I'm, I'm, I'm hope it's not, there's, I saw that on the website, there's no fluoride. So my pineal gland's not going to get calcified. So I just want to thank you for that. And uh, Gabe, <laughs> Batchik from Print. What up, guys? What's up, y'all? How you doing, man? What's happening, Robbie? We're doing great. Doug, you're up in uh, Hollywood, man. We were just talking about SF. I mean, uh. I know you're something of an entrepreneur outside of TV, TV role that you're kind of in. I mean, I guess I'm guessing you're sent a lot of crypto projects your way. Yeah, I mean, you know, there there's been a few. I mean, you know, my, my interest is more sort of in the blockchain, the utility, like how how does that unfold for entertainment, for distribution. I mean, all those things. I mean, I mean, you know, everything you guys are talking about about community. Yeah, you know, and, and also about how how we, the things we're facing in the world or in different business sectors. I mean, we're facing it in in entertainment. I mean, you know, distribution is upside down, and you know, buyers and distributors don't really know what they want, and and they're upside down. So, um, you know, self distribution and and creating community around projects, um, and you know, creating some value for the. The, the the people in that community right not just the entertainment value but different ways that they can experience and 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 um you know uh immerse themselves in that world i mean th- those things are all very interesting to me so anyway i love the conversations yeah. thus far what are you i'm curious like what you're involved in outside the tv world and also how many times you've been to the play playboy mansion inquiring minds want to know Jesus Christ, that's like an old reference, man. I mean, I mean, you know, I don't even think it exists anymore, but uh, I've been there twice. Um, so, yeah, I mean, listen, I, I mean, the thing I love about entertainment is, is that it casts a wide net, right? So what am I involved in other than TV? I'm, I'm involved in sports ventures. I'm involved in music ventures. Um you know, we're, we're, we're doing things in, 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 in the digital realm in in collectibles. I mean, you know, we're, we're looking at all things across the board. So, um, you know, I don't, and by the way, I'm, I'm, I'm in a funny way. I'm involved with Abe water, which I love e water as well. Um, and yo, yo, Doug. yo, yo. And I was, uh, and I am involved with, uh, with David in, in the symbols. So, you know, we just, uh, coincidentally you bring that up. So anyway, I, I don't know what, uh, what you'd like to hear about, but we can talk about whatever you want to talk about. Oh yeah. I mean, it's cool to know if you're seeing much of the blockchain in the entertainment industry. I mean, I'm curious if, you, if it's around Hollywood. I, or I mean, I mean, I'm seeing a lot of talk about it, right? And 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 I'm paying very close attention, right? Because you know, for everything you guys are, are are talking about, I mean, you know, for for authentication, for 
creating value, for creating second secondary market value. You, you know, I mean, every project I'm involved in these days, I mean, at least with, with smart people, it is about, you know, not just about, hey, how are we making a TV show or how are we making an event? An event, it's about how are we, you know, creating a 360 degree business around it, right? How does, how does this TV show translate into, um, uh, uh, into music or books or, or a virtual world or, or, uh, you know, a, a, a live experience an immersive experience, right? So, so everything that, that people are gravitating towards in terms of projects is, okay, so what are the layers, right? And, and blockchain comes up all the time, right? In terms of, um, you know, creating things that people can own as a way to really create a community and to create sort of an ecosystem around a property. So again, I'm certainly not as sophisticated in the understanding of it as everyone on this call, but again, I'm paying close attention. So, um, again, I see it talked more about than put into practice, um, you know, same thing with, you know, I, I, I dove in a little bit with, uh, with a group out of Australia and trying to create a metaverse for music, sort of like, uh, for lack of a better analogy, the sphere in the metaverse where artists, various artists could come and perform and do their thing. And, you know, people would buy, um, boxes and condos and all that kind of stuff. And it's like, you know, interesting concept and, and, and certainly cool. And, you know, there were some really great ideas that came out of it, but that technology in particular is it, just not there, man. I mean, that whole metaverse technology and it's moving quick. And I think, you know, Apple in the space will drive things forward. Um, I work a lot with Snapdragon, which is Qualcomm's, um, you know, entity that, um, is also, you know, we're, we're, we've done a number of sort of XR projects that are aimed at encouraging developers and encouraging the marketplace and moving that forward. But, uh, you know, uh, again, paying close attention, but, but none of it's quite there yet. And from my perspective, that's dope, man. I kind of want to introduce Dallas cause you know, he's kind of in a similar field as you, you know, he's producing TLC and Madonna and Dad Distribution, which is allowing artists to release their music on the blockchain, man. What, what, uh, tell me more about that, brother. What's up, y'all? How y'all doing, man? What up, what's up, Brock? And, uh, so, so all my other friends that's all. Hey, man. brother. Uh, yeah, well, fuck it off. <laughs> it's been, man, <laughs> my dudes. Oh, uh, yeah, man. So, what I noticed back, you know, uh, having a distribution company that I started a few years ago, I started actually before COVID, right? During COVID. Um, and I noticed. You know, I was like, man, having a regular distribution company, obviously, from a writer producer standpoint, I knew I wasn't getting paid. And I knew everybody else wasn't getting paid either. And I knew when um, when Sean when he when he when they started Spotify, you know, Sean came and showed it to me, and I said, man, that's just a, uh, you know, when he said, well, I said, well, how do we get paid? You know, and he goes, well, you know, it's a blanket license. And I go, well, damn, you just fucked us worse because now we, we subject to everybody else's, you know, uh, fees, you know, uh, fees and stuff. So. What I did was I started thinking, you know, I wonder how the first real music distribution company on the blockchain um, that was able to be understood by people who didn't understand blockchain, which was the first trick. Um, because, you know, uh, one of the things about us is having a regular distribution company. I can tell that, you know, five, you can tell as an artist that 5,000 people are like you in London. You just can't tell who they are. And so I started to say, well, it's not fair that you can't make money off of uh, your own fan base even if it's five to ten thousand people you just need to be able to adjust your own rates and ask for what you want for it so we came up with the technology to basically um have artists pick their own streaming rate they can either stream the record they can sell the record they can let you download it they can let you listen to it for a week a year a month everything is up to the artist totally period and once we built it all out um polygon came and gave us a grant a few years ago once we built it all out then it was so far You know, people, regular people aren't going to understand this. And, you know, when, like all of us, when we are all heavy, heavy into the blockchain and heavy, heavy into what's happening with it, we all understand it's a whole nother world. And for us that's in that world, we understand how to survive in it. But for the people that's not, 
you know, how, how do they understand it? And so first off, we hooked it up and so okay, here, you know, load up, your, connect your MetaMask, connect your wallet, connect your this or that. And I said, well, that's not going to work because what happens if I write a song with Brock and Brock's in, uh, you know, Puerto, uh, somewhere else or what, uh, if he doesn't have a, a wallet. So we changed this. Okay. Well, what if we just made it where, um, we use the email addresses and also let's back it back some more. Let's make it a, a version of a marketplace so people can see who's there. Let's back it back a little bit more and make it where it's direct Apple Pay, Google Pay, or credit card. For people that don't have a wallet or don't understand it, that's fine. Let's make the technology on the backside, create the um, key to logins forum. And for each artist, for each uh, smart contract, we have up to 80 people per smart contract. So you can have 80 you know, writers or producers on it with you. And the way it works now is just basically, if I got your email address, then, you know, if a dollar comes in and we're splitting that dollar, then the 57 will go to you and 57 will go to me instantly to our accounts. Um, I feel like um, the next step in the music industry period or the entertainment industry, because we do it for podcasts or video for music, is for you to be able to, as an independent, to choose your own rates. Uh, we've been locked forever by the rates of, you know, the distribution companies or whoever else, but it's never been a time you can say, well, I actually want $8 or $5 or $20 or $30 for my record. Um, and that's just the, the point we're at now. So we're providing that at that distro. Um, and we're seeing, it, it's, it's surprisingly, um, you know, I think everybody went through the phase where the word NFT and crypto started to be scary out here to them. So, um, it, but the blockchain, you know, is the most effective and efficient way of, you know, being transparent. And I think that using the blockchain on the backside and fronting it with uh, the Apple Pay and Google Pay and stuff like that, because people used to stock X, they used to buy things from their phones. Uh, but it's a shame you just can't buy music that way. Is how I looked at it, and it should go direct to the artists and producers that, that made it. Yeah, I mean, I think Dallas. You know, you when you told me about this, and for people that don't know Dallas, he's a trailblazer. He, you know, he not only does he make amazing records, but he's also out there thinking. Okay, so I'm looking at my record contracts, I'm looking at my publishing deals, I'm looking at everything that I've done, and you know, you can imagine when you've worked with artists like TLC, that it's pretty significant in terms of trying to keep a track of everything that's, that's meant to be coming your way. So he goes, all right, I'm going to create my own distribution network, which again, for anyone who's not in the music biz, that's really the, the bit that connects the artist, or maybe along with their label, but to the um, platforms where you listen to the music, right? So distribution takes your product from the factory in inverted commas out to the marketplace. Um, and so looking at that, he goes, okay, this is, how do I do this? How can we make this, you know, clearer for, for artists that maybe don't engage with the blockchain at this point, um, but actually to have, you know, involvement with that, which for me, looking at the whole landscape is, is really interesting because I'm going, well, if Doug DeLuke is making a TV show, then why shouldn't his accounting be on this type of technology so he can put up that information straight away and see where all of his, his deals are going, his deal flow on that TV show? Or, you know, for Dallas and his artist, hey, well, this got played directly by that person, so that's your bit. It automatically cuts it up in the same way that I'm guessing for people when he sells a piece, um, you know, if he wants to put into that contract that he takes a tiny percentage, um, if the, if the piece gets sold on somebody else, it's all automated. And, and ultimately in the, in the world that we live in, the thing that's really difficult, particularly if you're an entrepreneur, which every person that I just mentioned is, um, it's really difficult to, to kind of keep track of all that stuff, particularly if you're, if you're getting involved with like big businesses, I've, I've got some deals outside of music stuff with big businesses. And if they want to lose you in their accounting department, whether they mean to do it or don't, you know, which, which by the way is a, is a minefield. It's a nightmare. They can do it really easily. And one, one of the things that I like about this as a technology, you know, in terms of utility, again, going back to this idea of it, not just all being about, crypto bros taking a punt and sort of degenerate behavior on shit coins um, is how, how can we use this? How does this become part of something that we do? Um, you know, I, I want to um, get to a water and, and also print protocol, which was something that just looking around, I, I saw it was something where I went, wow, this is a project to project group who are trying to make it easier for people to have involvement with the blockchain. 
and that you know that for me as somebody who's a i guess a an entrepreneur is really where the value is for everybody is you know how do we use something that's positive that's already part of the fabric of our of our lives whether you know it or not it's blockchain is there um, well, you know, what's interesting, Rocco, is that I, um, when, I, you know, the technology we have, I have it at DAD now, but the, the, the idea is that I would put it everywhere, you know, embedded in the Amazon and into other places so creatives can start getting paid from, you know, from, what from their work. And I've seen people, you know, load up the, their work and say, okay, I want 35 bucks for it. So I, I could probably look at it and say, oh, man, who's going to give this person that much? But you know what? It's up to them. But you know what? The 10 people that did made them more money than they would have made on Spotify with thousands and thousands of streams. Yeah, um, I mean, probably so hundreds of thousands community, of streams, right? Community-wise, you know, like, uh, back to community, the creative community, I, I'm just not a... I, I, I did. I come from the days of we... Was, our our uh, problem was, are we going to sell 500,000 or a million the first week? All right? So we wasn't... so. Now, when I look at the, the business structure and I see that what happened to the music business, you know, I was there watching it. And, and a lot of the guys that the older guys were running it going, well, it's not going to happen on our watch, so we don't care. So, you know, the movie industry got a chance to see it happen and say, OK, well, screw that. We're not going to let, uh, you know, the uh, DSPs or whatever take our, our movies. We're going to do HBO Max. We're going to do NBC Peacock. We're going to do Disney Plus. And that didn't happen in the music business. They didn't do, you know, Sony Digital Music or all get together and say, let's be one one system. So it kind of got screwed. And to a lot of the creators now, it's sad that if you have 5 million people, there's a lot of people to listen to a song. But if you got 5 million people, that's considered nothing and no money at this point. So if that 5 million people even gave you, you know, a, a quarter or a dime even, you know, then you'd be making money again. So I, I had a problem with really this gate, this thing blocking up creative people uh, to, where, to where you really can't make any money in a user generated, a user content generated world. You're making it on your, on your Mac. You're not having to go to, you know, a $300,000 studio per day to, to make an album. You know, you're making it at home. You're making it on your own equipment. You're distributing it and stuff, but then you're not making the money from it. So right. my goal is to put this technology everywhere so it could be used by creatives. Yeah. So there's basically, I mean, you know, in a nutshell, there's a lot of people in the middle of all these deals, right? Uh, you know, ba basic flow is idea comes to Dallas in his studio. He captures it. It's brilliant. He finishes the record and then everybody else in the middle gets involved, right? Which historically there were some great music managers and their job was to come along and say, Hey, I love your music. I'm going to help you with the business side and then, and then hopefully do the right thing. Right. And then all these other people pile in over time. And then you get the added element of digital distribution networks, you know, and I'm not saying I'm for or against Spotify, but all I care about as someone that is creative and also host creatives is that there isn't someone in the middle of all of that who just doesn't care. They're like, hey, there are 80,000 singles a day, so we're just going to see which one rises to the top, and we're going to make our money, whatever happens. I mean, they've, you know, as a business model, they've, they've done the right thing because they've basically just cared about the, the, the money that they're making, right? But as we know as creatives, and probably as a community of people that don't like that kind of thing, the, the aim is to be awesome and to try and share amazing stuff with other people to inspire them right um so if you can take out that type of behavior and you can actually make sure as you say if, if someone has five million plays of a song and or, or downloads and it's a dollar each then that artist that created it should be getting more than a few few cent you know i mean sure if they've borrowed a lot of money to record that's one thing that you pay it back but the, the system is kind of outdated, and I, I think, again, it's a bit of a cliche that we're really very early here, um, but I feel like there are enough people with good minds swimming around this whole concept that when it, when it locks in, we're going we're gonna to see it happen. Yeah. Me and Brock talked about this. Uh, we started talking about this before, and the community you guys are talking about, I guess it is Burning Man, Brock. I guess that's the community that just, you know, if it was full of crypto instead of just trading, then that, that's that's the community we'll be at. But, you know, all of us, uh, you know, we I had this conversation with Itai, you know, all of us that are involved in 8Water. Um, and by the way, I'm a fan of everybody on here. Um, really, everybody. I'm, I'm a big fan of Beeples, all you guys. Um, so thanks for, thanks for having me on here. Um, but one of the things we've been talking about with, with Ape Water and music and, you know, all of us that had apes or had dogs or whatever we've had all up, you know, not NFT uh, wallets, um, it got to the point where, 
you know, like anything else, the word became, you know, uh, it's like you know, it's, been t it's been tainted and, and it, like they wanted it to. But we have all these these things that have like such a valuable, you know, asset to them, you know. And so even when we're talking about Ape Water and all of us that, that are partners in Ape Water, you know, the one common ground is the community of it. And then how we bring the music and how we bring the, the you know, the connections and how we bring the energy that we have to something that started on the blockchain. But, you know, the, mo the, the bigger value of it is going to be accessed by people who don't know it started on the blockchain. It's kids that see the ape water can in Atlanta and all they say is, man, look at that cool can. It's other kids that see it and say, oh, man, that, that ape could cost $200,000. Um, but the majority of people don't even, the kids don't even know it came from uh, the blockchain because it's such a cool can and it's great water. Um, but it's still, you know, between us taking music and doing cool ideas like putting the QRC codes on the back for festivals and having music tied into it, it's still another way of distribution. Um, and it's still another way of getting access with creative people, you know, to be able to access some, from, a dis from a distribution standpoint. Uh, I think it was Lightning in a Bottle. What is yeah. it, Ty? Yeah, Lightning in a Bottle. And we do like digital collectibles off the can or it can be a loyalty program. But it's really the water's the Trojan horse into the experience of Web3 with no one really knowing what they're going into. So they just get a music a 2.5 wallet. And then to your point, Dallas, it can be music that can be streamed directly off the can and no easier way than going to an old school model of having a, a product you like to, you need a drink when you're getting hot and then having experience to the masses. Speaking of the can, Itai, I mean, we're speaking with uh, the founder of Ape Water. I really wanted to know more about how you got bored Ape Yacht Club on your product. This is, we're speaking with Itai Leffer, CEO and founder of Ape Water. Curious about how you did get that on the product, man. I, I love your your work. Well, thanks, Robin. Sorry, jumping in, Dallas. Appreciate the the segue into this. But um, I'm here with Andrew as well, my co-founder. We're actually sitting here in, in Denver, running around, setting up Colorado for the business, and also crossing into East Denver. In East Denver, so it's quite a timely conversation. Yeah, guys, what's going on? This is Andrew, co-founder with Etai. Yeah, uh, we're launching in Colorado, effectively uh, March first. So we're going to be in hundreds of convenience and grocery stores, and that's a really nice touch point to really be this mass distribution vessel for Web3. And to answer your question about Yuga Labs, we had a decision to make when we first started Ape Water was whether we wanted to buy a BAYC. We trademarked and owned the word ape for beverage non-alc. And the decision was ultimately to license apes, so we celebrate other apes and feature different apes on our cans. So at this point, I think, Itai, we have, what, 29 apes? Yeah. And uh, we'll continue to add more apes and other ape IP and also, I'll put this in the chat using my own personal um, Twitter or X. Uh, we can even put Bitcoin on our cans. And so we really want to celebrate all things Web3 well beyond just Yuga. Are you guys currently hydrated? I think everybody wants to know. Yeah, we're always hydrated. We, n we never stay thirsty, and that's just part of our business model. Um, but in, in terms of all that, like, Rob, did we... We, what we did, we sampled the BAYC as our kind of first template into like launching into the masses. Obviously, it gave us exposure that we couldn't have ever dreamed of, just launching a typical brand in, the, in CPG, it's like using the celebrity status without the celebrity. But then, you know, just to what, um, what Brock had mentioned about the Dollar Donation Club, we met with Seth, he's the, you know, the guy that started, I think, with you, Brock. Legend of a guy, but he made that transition for us to be able to give back to community, give back to cleaning the environment through the Dollar Donation Club, so seamless. And working with groups like that, to help us do things that we want to do to help, whether it's environmental, whether it's bringing communities together, we really want to work with the, the leaders in the space to do that together. Yeah, uh, you know, it's heavy to talk uh, by, about By plastic. the way, uh, live here in spaces, if you want to, uh, if you want to have, add another ape to the mix, my ape is nine six four. Brock, Brock. We'll, we'll come over and we'll chat. We'll chat about that later. Yeah, later. sounds good, Brock, for sure. Uh, nine six four. I'm writing that down. I didn't know that. You didn't. Uh, you never told me. <laughs> You're a man of I mystery. Mean, come on. I'm an. I, 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 I'm. 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 Got you know apes and everything. I uh, know. I know. You're everywhere, Brock. You're. You're om omnipresent. Uh, yeah. Uh, in respect to the plastic, you know, it's it's a heavy subject talking about plastics and environments and things like that. So we really use the ape water can and the playfulness and the BAYC IP to be able to introduce something to the audience that otherwise wouldn't be receptive of such, you know, challenging topics such as plastic and, and how it affects the ecology and, you know, the, uh, and the human body. I mean, yeah, you guys got to all celebrate at Brock's wedding at Burning Man. I hope you guys, I think you guys would be perfect guests. <laughs> <laughs> Brock, 
What makes uh, Brock? I thought we, I thought you got married on the plane, Brock. When we was going from uh, Gumball, I thought that was your wedding. I mean, that's 2018 Gumball driving a, uh, a Florian from London to Tokyo. Satoshi has the license plate, and uh, uh, the flux capacitor from Back to the Future, Ready Player One in the car. I thought that was quite good. That was a good time, Dallas. We have to catch up off off this. Yes, buddy. <laughs> So oh, and, 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 and I'm not going to forget yeah. that you said if Brock and I made a song. So I want to hit the studio. <laughs> That's right. I want to hear the right. Brock and Dallas Gumball song. I definitely want to hear that. Gumball yeah. Puerto Rico. Yeah. Can we um, release, we'll release it off the can? We'll do a Gumball can and we'll release it off the can for the masses. Can we release that Brock's Wedding at Burning Man? Brock, there are you, you doing another Wedding at Burning Man this year? <laughs> there you go. I, I, you know, I, I need to find a, a partner for that project. <laughs> we'll do it. We'll, well do I'll it, be there. We'll, we'll do a casting. <laughs> um, so for anyone that, that, that didn't know Eight Water before, um, you know, maybe Ito or Andrew, you could just say a little bit about where the water's from. Yeah. Even what the can looks like, you know, and the the medallion that you're the the picture that you're talking about on the can, um, you know, you you have people on the line. Maybe he wants to be involved with that as well. But tell us a bit more about it. Yeah. So the can is a Trojan horse to educate people on Web three and digital IP. Just how the Wheaties box will celebrate Michael Jordan or Michael Phelps. Uh, we want to celebrate IP, and so we always cycle different. Uh, groups that have authority in the space, obviously people, that would be amazing to explore doing something with you. And um, our water is sourced uh, from spring to table. So we source local springs, local supply chains. It's kind of the ape ideology, right? Like humans, like let's use like a challenger, we're a challenger brand to a brand like Evian. Evian's been around forever. It's in plastic. It trucked into the U.S., across the Atlantic, from the French Alps. That doesn't make any sense. So to us, that's like boomer technology. Where we're using using our can as like the next generation's water, so we have springs in Northern California, which is Mount Shasta, as well as Southern California, yep. and now recently Georgia, and we're also talking to a spring in the local Colorado area. So we're going to keep adding springs, which kinds of gives us this unique competitive advantage because we're not um, relegated to one particular supply chain. So it allows us to grow the brand internationally at scale. That's awesome, and you're you're currently in. Are you? How many states are you guys in at the moment? We I'm just went off. US, yeah, right? yeah, we're just in three states in the U.S. California and limited distribution, Nevada and Colorado. But we have a pretty aggressive rollout strategy. Um, it's it's always you know good to mention a brand that we like to pay homage to, which is Liquid Death. They've done an incredible job building out a brand, and they're the and and the category of uh, spring water in a can. And so um, they're at 100,000 points of distribution in the U.S., and we are going to be trailing them and adding more states side by side. Yeah, and, and, the, and Rocco, thanks for having us on as well and sharing the vision. Like as Andrew mentioned, the water and the source is everything. It's, what's in the product is the most important thing for most people. The people at the beginning was telling us, just put tap water in us, just make it fun. We really believed in the longevity of this brand to make it you know, this generation's water choice. Um, and then from that, we really want to go out to mass market and hit the retail platform just like Liquid Death has done. But we want to do it in a different way where we're not just challenging by the water the spec. It's about the gamification off the can and all the utility that we can create that brings back to the blockchain. And that's where the fun really starts to begin. But we just, we're building it. I don't want to be saying too much too soon, but we're building different platforms off the yeah. can that can play these games so we can really tie in the whole idea of gameplay. And the water is just, again, truly a Trojan horse. Into yeah, it. just to kind of like give a, a reference point that might land, especially if someone's, I don't know, 35 plus listening, is Web1 was platforms like America Online. How they were able to scale to such, such success was through the CD-ROM. And everyone was able to get the CD-ROM. And that's how you got onto the Internet 1.0. And so we view the CAN as that CD-ROM solution to really get people educated beyond our bubble of, of Web3, which is great, we really want to appeal to a much broader audience and in, in scale accordingly. I, mean, I told him it's funny because uh, being in Atlanta, um, you know, uh, I have an eight water here. I've never heard people, you know, we're in the South, man. It's not really like a water place like that, but I've never heard people pick up a can of water and be like, man, this is, what's this, what's in this water? It's incredible. And I was like, I can taste the difference in water. Can you? He said, yeah, man, this is amazing. Um, sort of, you know, we're, we're excited about 
I think both parts of it is being able to use the the IP um, and have people that that does have the apes and uh, and that that you know free people from the art world just use the IP and be able to have it exposed out here in another way. That's that's one of the things we're excited about and just you know saving the planet. Yeah, um, I think can. By having canned water, you know, hopefully everybody goes to can at some point. And we're just, you know, in in a, in a lineup to help get rid of plastic. Yeah, yeah. So um, I'm sort of feeling like there's a there's a sort of current theme that runs through everything that we discussed, which is that the, the community cares. It seems like that, without being too much of a hippie about it. Yeah. People have ideas for how the how the future looks. You know. Yeah. Um, and, and I also like what you said, Dallas, about the can being kind of like a canvas, like what Mike was saying about, you know, using the sphere as a canvas and seeing more canvases everywhere that you can actually put this messaging, which, which goes with the web three community out there. Right. Cool. Um, so kind of concurrently to that, um, cause I, I want to make sure that Gage comes up and has a, has a chat cause we've got an amazing group of people here. But, um, you know, Gage, we're kind of looking at the, the, the landscape and everybody's saying, all right, I'm a creative. I want to get involved, right? You've got musicians can talk with Dallas, um, you know, Mike and David and, and the kind of creative crew are looking at the blockchain as a, as a marketplace and a way to get that stuff out there. And what I was picking up on from you guys was that you're involved. I, again, my knowledge of this is fairly limited, but Solana Network seems to be a network that has a lot of a lot of meme coins on it you know things like dog with hat that i saw made me laugh and i thought wow that really is the the kind of epitome of a shit coin um where something just doesn't have a point it's like a kid drawing a mustache on on their pitch with their grandfather you can stick a hat on them right but when i saw what print was doing i was like oh that's kind of interesting and maybe we should find out from them more about how they see this interaction with creativity and community and how do you allow other people to get their projects on the blockchain is that is that what you guys are doing yeah uh you hit it oh can you i can't tell if i'm unmuted can I, you hear me? I can hear you yeah okay it's just it's just uh twitter so you actually hit the nail honestly right on the head with what we're doing and so i want to i'm going to answer that question i'm going to take the long way so i don't just shield the project but really bring you on with our ethos. So what uh, Robbie said earlier about Burning Man, man, that resonated so hard with me. And it, I can already tell it was resonating with some other people. And so to just bring the other 500 listeners right on page with this like inside joke, Burning Man is super interesting because it's a connection of two seemingly opposite people. You've got these extremely like nerdy, technical minded uh, developers, and they come together to hang out with like insanely like artists that's driving emotion uh and they get together to perform a real live festival and to a lot of people from the outside they see something like that and they're like oh it's like this makes no sense like these people are so different and to me like fundamentally they both actually are driven by the same thing which is what this whole thing has been about and that's creativity so i'm from the developer side and as a developer um, i'm actually not even infatu infatuated with like the programming and the coding and the technicality part of it what I fall in love with is building things for other people, the creation for other people. And why that is so like, you know, inspiring is because crypto is that it's that same way. It's that stiletto, the middle ground, right? You have people like Shube who are doing super, um, you know, technical tokenomic stuff to allow masses for adoption. And then you have people like people who are, you know, pioneering the art realm of it. And they can come together on one platform because fundamentally they're doing the same thing under the hood, which is creating. Um, and at print, you know, like our, our ethos is to kind of like take that one step further. So we're super believers of utility. And why you have people like Brock who may be super bullish about uh, where crypto is going or, or, you know, the inventor of Dogecoin, who's maybe a little bit more skeptical after his run in, they both got excited about utility. And I think fundamentally that's because utility to me is just where creativity meets use. Right. It's take these ideas that people have and these like uh, ways they can solve problems and make things better and then build actual use to them. And, and fundamentally, that's utility. So print protocol, what we do is we're just utility, but at the token level. Uh, and they, you know, the team initially came to me and they're like, hey, Solana, we have 
the ability to create all these different types of tokens, uh, but no one's really taking advantage of it. It's just like too hard. They wanted to build a token that when holders held the token, they got rewarded just for holding it. Uh, and no one could really do that yet. Like essentially that had to happen at a higher, a higher level. Like you had to go to a different platform or you had to rely on, you know, staking or these other things. You couldn't just have the token and get rewarded for it. Uh, and when Solana, they allowed these extensions on our to tokens. Um, and so fundamentally, that's what that allowed me to do. It allowed me to build an extension that would reward users for holding the token. So we became the first stole based rewards token. The industry dubbed that reflections, but all that fancy stuff is just to say that if you buy some print, when print gets traded, when there's volume, we take a small fee and we, we distribute that back to the holders. And so what that, that does that, is... That would be rather like being an investor. Let's say I find a new business and I say, I'm going to invest in this business because I like it and I'm going to get paid something as an investor for backing it. Yeah, so it's very similar to that. It'd be like essentially like staking, but you don't have to have any of the knowledge or do it. It's just built into the coin by default. It's built into the base layer. Right, yeah. What's uh, the difference? Imagine, in, imagine I'm a novice in that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, I, so, that, so print is a little bit, you know, technical, but the, the cool thing to know there is that this, like, you know, this idea of utility where we're going to, like, provide some utility around art or we're going to provide some utility around this DeFi platform, that is now at a lower level. So with print, that's at the token level, meaning that you as a user can be fully removed from it. You don't have to worry about it or, or know about it. And as a, as a creative, we want to give people the tools to do that themselves. So that's where the whole utility, you know, is kind of our ethos comes into play. Like print was a successful token we launched. It, it you know, maybe not as big as his Doge, but um, was widely used. It is, is provided a lot of value for the holders. Uh, but, you know, our, our ideas were never just to like take print and then like do this stuff for ourselves. We want to take those tools that we use in print and then give them to people who don't have the technical knowledge to do them. Uh, and so that's why we're launching print decks, which comes out around the 31st. And essentially that will provide people who don't have the technical understanding to be able to take their ideas and launch them using on Solana, they're called transfer hooks. But it's just a fancy way of saying, if you have an idea uh, for something that could be done at token level, we can make it possible for you to do that. Uh, a good example would be like Shibe said earlier, man, I want to use crypto, but the taxes are horrible, right? Like it's just impossible to use for me at this moment because I have to get everything done at certain timestamps and whatnot. Well, what if at the contract level, right, we had all the tax laws and codes for whatever his state, he chooses his state is built into the token. So when he uses the token, all the taxing is done at that purchase level and put aside for him. So when he goes to do his taxes next year, it's just there and he didn't have to do anything and it was built right into the token. That's what a transfer hook would do. Um, and essentially that's what we would provide to the people, right? We would, we would have a hook for that. So, so there'd be the, again, just to understand this, there would be part of this utility that you offer. This tax would be sent partly to the people that are the holders as the investors that send inverted commas. And then there's a bit that you're cutting off, which is going to be capital for the project to grow. Right. So that's fundamentally kind of how printers, but for the decks, it would be, you would be able to do that for whatever idea you had. At yeah. Okay. okay. I get that. Okay. So it's actually just suddenly occurred to me that, you know, someone that was an artist could say, okay, buy into my artist name, uh, my token name. And you know, you'll be a, you'll be a supporter of my career, but at the same time, a little bit of what you're buying into will actually allow me to reinvest into my career. For example, I mean, that's a, no, that's actually a perfect use case, um, right? You could have your own token as the artist that backs you where part of it goes into the protocol that shares with the entire community that's backing you. And then part of it is just for you. And that can be done at the token level where, you know, you don't have to worry about that. The people who buy the token don't have to worry about that. It just happens, right? It's kind of like yeah. magic. That is cool. The, the other day I was messing around, I was registering a URL on... I think it might have been GoDaddy. And I was just amazed, and I don't know if anyone else has seen this, but you register a name, and then it comes up with, like, AI logo creation for your website. 
it comes up with writing the by writing the text for your website. It's like the whole you can build a website in like four minutes now using AI once you've registered the name. And I was just blown away by how easy that was. Um, and I feel like with you know with this, everything that we're discussing today, um, there there is a certain level of technicality. And I was I was talking to Robbie about it, saying, well, what you know, what are what are the downsides to the blockchain? Um, and obviously, you know people having all their money taken or clicking the wrong link or, you know, people making natural human error. Um, you know, there's, there's a kind of, there, there is no guard there for things going wrong. You know, if you, if you got your money in the bank, the reason in theory that you're paying the bank to, you know, interest and whatever, or fees is because they're kind of there to protect you. Obviously some people won't, won't feel that way. Um, but I do like, no, I like it is totally, that. It's totally true though. And at print, we see like, we see those things as just apps, right? So like, oh, I want to tie my token to myself as a person in real life. Well, there's a hook for that. Or I want to add a, you know, a transfer tax on my, on my token to give rewards to my holders. Well, there'll be a hook for that. Or I want to, you know, deal with tax regulation. Well, there'll be a hook for that. And you can yeah. just add those to your token. A small part of it will go back to the original print token. Um, and everything else is self-managed. So you have this, yeah, easy to build platform for people who want to be more technical, but at the end of the day, uh, you can just put tools in the hands of creatives and let them create, right? Because one, one yeah. successful token is cool, but a uh, hundred different successful tokens that we can't even think of right now, I mean, that's game changing.